The practice of skull binding has been prevalent across the world for thousands of years. Contemporary anthropology will usually attribute this phenomenon to convergent cultural adaptations arising independently in respective areas across the world. The practice usually involves the deformation of infants' heads from birth, using wooden platforms and ropes to constrict the undeveloped cranium. This process takes many years until a desired aesthetic is produced. In many of the ancient cultures that practice skull binding, the desired aesthetic is an elongated head, which for many cultures signified intelligence and high social status. The phenomenon has been found to have occurred in ancient Egypt, Mesoamerica, South America, Central Asia, and Europe. Skull binding dates back thousands of years, but remained prominent in some parts of the world until very recently. Scholars and academics believe to understand the fundamental reasons for this practice, yet there are many mysteries surrounding this ancient ritual that have not been conclusively solved. In addition to this, the consistency of practices across the world has not been examined from an open-minded perspective by mainstream archaeologists and anthropologists. In this video, I will attempt to dissect the global phenomenon of skull binding and shed light on its origins and possible connectivity. Intentional cranial deformation refers to the act of manipulating the skull of an individual through various methods of constriction to produce a desired aesthetic. The process of cranial deformation relies on external forces which are applied to the growth of infant skulls. It is only possible to manipulate the growth of the cranium during infancy when the cranium is still undeveloped and malleable. This practice varies greatly across cultures and time, but the consistency of cosmetic cranial deformation found across cultures from around the world perplexes archaeologists and anthropologists. The first known case of cranial deformation was found present in Neanderthal remains from Iraq at a site called the Shanidar Cave, dated to be around 47,000 years old. These findings have later been disputed by many archaeologists. However, there remains debate over the specimens found and whether or not cranial deformation had taken place, which would imply that if it had taken place, cranial deformation is not only a phenomenon which is found among Homo sapiens, but also other species of hominid, such as Neanderthals. The custom of cranial deformation has been observed and documented by Hippocrates, Aristotle, and Herodotus in various texts detailing skulls found in the Balkans and Caucasus more than 2,000 years ago. Since ancient Greece, the practice of cranial deformation has been a topic of discussion and interest amongst Western academics. Yet, the true nature and origins of these practices has scarcely been thoroughly studied by academia. Some archaeologists have even configured that artificial cranial deformation is perhaps the oldest cultural practice on Earth. Mainstream archaeologists have found evidence of cranial deformation in Europe occurring around 7,000 years ago. Similar customs have been found to have occurred across Africa, Asia, and the Americas during the Copper Bronze Age around 6,000 to 4,500 years ago. The emergence of this practice in various locations across the globe, within a congruent timeline, leads many anthropologists to posit that these cultural customs evolved independently. However, the sole basis for this argument seems to be the integration of distance into the equation. When distance is considered, it becomes evident that, within academia, there is a major barrier preventing further entertainment of any idea which suggests correlation. The distances ancient people would have had to traverse in order to transfer such cultural customs would have required immense amounts of energy. Therefore, the simplest solution is that cranial deformation arose independently across the world. However. There are striking similarities between cranial deformation customs found across the world, and the similar time frame of their global emergence is something worth investigating. The reasons for conducting this custom have largely remained a mystery. Some researchers believe that cranial deformation arose as a form of signifying social status. 
In some instances, cranial deformation was used to distinguish tribes from one another. It has also been suggested that these practices were used to make soldiers appear taller and more threatening during battle. And in a few isolated cases throughout history, such as the Lesser Antilles Islands during the 17th century, the custom was adopted by escaped slaves in an attempt to assimilate with native cultures to avoid further capture. But the true origin of the practice remains incredibly difficult to trace. However, many peoples within cultures which have recently practiced cranial deformation claim that they are following the instruction of their ancestors in order to please the gods. There is also speculation amongst researchers that this practice arose in an attempt to reproduce the physical appearances of deities. The Paracas culture of southern Peru existed from around 900 BCE to around 400 CE. However, the dates associated with the timeline of the Paracas culture has been widely debated. This is me wandering through the Paracas Desert around five years ago. All right, so we managed to get your ride on the back of a truck. Not bad. We have no idea where we're going. Not a single clue where we are. Let's keep going. The Paracas culture is one which has undergone intense academic scrutiny for decades. Most of the controversy surrounding this ancient Andean culture stems from the mysterious traditions of infant skull binding associated with the region. The ancient people of the Paracas region not only participated in the practice of skull binding, but they are also responsible for producing some of the most well-preserved mummies anywhere found on Earth. In a place called Wari Kayan in the Paracas Peninsula, excavators discovered the remains of hundreds of mummified people in the desert. The bodies of these individuals were found to be wrapped extensively in layers of cloth to protect against decomposition. The burials found at Wari Kayan have been dated to around 150 BCE to 250 CE. Archaeologists have been able to study the Paracas people thoroughly because of the incredible preservation of the mummies found across the Paracas Peninsula. One aspect that stands out to even the most untrained eyes is the cranial deformation present in many of these bodies. The first evidence of Andean cranial deformation, or skull binding, can be found across the Andes dating back to the pre-ceramic period, around 3,800 years BCE. This practice likely developed in the region and was adopted by the Paracas culture, suggesting that the origins of Andean skull binding are much older. Most archaeologists have attributed the older evidence of cranial deformation found across Peru to an unintentional production, and that many of these bodies found to predate the Paracas culture with elongated or deformed heads must have been the result of accidental deformation. The current consensus is that the first intentional cranial deformation began during the time of the Paracas culture. This is in part due to the lack of evidence for methods that would have been used by earlier societies to modify infant skulls. However, this lack of evidence may in part be the result of how much older the pre-ceramic period societies would have been, making the excavation and discovery of methods used by these people much more challenging. It is possible that these practices can be traced back much further in time to another society which transmitted these cultural traits. The ancient Egyptians are some of the most well-known cultures across the world to have participated in the practice of cranial deformation upon infancy. This practice first appeared in ancient Egypt around 2000 BCE, and was considered to be a sign of beauty and status. During the 18th dynasty of ancient Egypt, around 1353 to 1336 BCE, the pharaoh Akhenaten had assumed power over Egypt after the death of his father, Amenhotep. During his reign, Akhenaten had altered much of Egyptian religious philosophy as well as contemporary art. He insisted on having a very particular portrayal of himself and his family to be produced in hieroglyphs during his reign. The hieroglyphs during this time depict Akhenaten and his heirs as possessing extremely elongated heads with very strange bodily proportions. During the end of the 18th dynasty, Tutankhamun, also known as King Tut, had assumed power over Egypt. 
Tutankhamun had possessed an elongated skull, something that had been produced through cranial deformation practices upon birth. The remains of Tutankhamun were discovered in 1923. Historians have long debated the origins of ancient Egyptian skull binding, and many have come to believe that this practice was the result of reproducing genetic deformities caused by inbreeding for aesthetic purposes. This hypothesis would help to explain why multiple cultures across the world would have developed similar practices, and it would make sense that this would be a sign of royalty considering that royalty across the world for the most part in many isolated cases has become very inbred as well as that conditions such as microcephaly often occur and could have influenced cultures across the globe. However, there is a multitude of genetic deformities known to occur commonly amongst humans. The question remains as to why artificial cranial deformation was favored across various cultures throughout history, and most importantly, why it survived for millennia. The practice of cranial deformation in China dates back millennia. Scientists have determined that the practice occurred at a place called Hautoa Muga around 12,000 to 5,000 years ago. A study conducted at the Jiling University of Archaeology in China concluded that the reasons and motivations behind the skull binding traditions found at Hautoa Muga still remain largely unknown by archaeologists. The study compared the skulls found at Hautoa Muga with those from the Americas and Europe and maintained an open mind to the idea that correlation may still have yet to be discovered. 25 skeletons were found at the site which possessed extremely modified skulls. To date, Hautoa Muga is officially the oldest known body of evidence for the skull binding tradition in Eastern Asia, and many archaeologists believe this region to be the root of the practice itself. It is entirely possible that the tradition began somewhere near this region and then spread across the Americas. However, this would imply that people from the Hautuamuga region of China would have had to migrate out of Asia and across both American continents in an extremely short period of time. The skull binding practices of the Paracas region in Peru date back to around the same time as some of the practices discovered in China. Either these customs evolved independently or trans-Pacific cultural transmission had occurred in an astonishingly short period of time. The practice of intentional cranial modification is one which we may never fully understand. Its origins are shrouded in mystery and controversy, and perhaps that is how they will remain. However, the consistency of this practice found across the scope of time and space is something that should not be overlooked. Many archaeologists shrug at the sound of this idea as it threatens the contemporary narrative of human global expansion. Many would rather believe that these practices spontaneously arose independently across the globe within around a thousand year margin, and perhaps they are right. But it also remains a valid hypothesis that these customs were transferred across cultures. For the most part, archaeologists haven't a clue as to why these customs arose in the first place making this practice even more mysterious. One thing is for certain, more research needs to be conducted on this ancient custom on a cross-cultural scale, and the hypothesis of communication between ancient groups of people in the past must be taken more seriously by anthropologists and archaeologists.